Farm Gal. This is episode number seven. I'm Deborah, and I am a third generation uh, of my family to own this farm that I live on. And I raise uh, grass-fed beef cattle. I raise horses and show quality rabbits and some heritage poultry. I try very hard to raise as much of what I eat as possible, although I'm far from self-sufficient because I can't grow chocolate and Diet Coke. So until then, I'll just do the best that I can. I'm also a professor of physics and astronomy at a local four-year university where I teach classes ranging from the general educational physical science all the way through senior level astrophysics and meteorology. Um, I am a volunteer at a local riding program for young people where I teach riding lessons and keep my own show horses. And I also volunteer at our local state parks. Uh, in addition to that, as you can see here with my co-host, Willie, I am fur kid mom to 14 dogs and five indoor cats uh, and several undetermined number of outdoor barn cats. Um, so this podcast will be about my crafting and, which includes knitting, crochet, sewing, quilting, basket making. I like to do all the crafts. Um, there's always something more to learn, isn't there, in the crafting world. And then also I like to talk about uh, science and some of the things that I do at my university professorship job. And I also uh, like to talk about just farm life. So if you want to follow me, my farm Facebook page is Buckthorn Farms, the same as my channel name here on YouTube. I'm also on Instagram and Ravelry as Doc Firewoman, where you can find me. There is a Ravelry group for the podcast called Diary of a Physicist Farm Gal, where you can find out about any um, make-alongs or, or uh, discussion of, of different things. Uh, I am going to start a Q&A um, uh, topic in there in case you're interested. I don't know what questions you would have about my wacky life, but feel free to ask away. Uh, and I'm also on Twitter, but I will remind you I'm a little bit of a liberal snowflake. So unless you, and then tw Twitter's where I sort of vent my um, political opinions more than anywhere else. So uh, unless you get, unless you want your blood pressure to go up or mine to go up, <laughs> you might not want to follow me on there. But anyway, I'm most active on the Instagram and on my farm Facebook page anyway. So I try to podcast. Uh, it seems like it's been every week lately but this next week i have to stay late at work uh to attend an award ceremony um for service learning so i will not be podcasting as planned next week i don't know if i'll have time later in the week too or not but if not i will be back the following week so i want to welcome you to this podcast i hope you enjoy it and this is diary of a physicist farm gal episode number seven <laughs> Okay, guys, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my charity make-along that I'm hosting. Uh, there is a thread in the Ravelry group for both Chatter and Finished Objects. Uh, the charity make-along is running from now until July the 2nd, which is my birthday. And basically, you can do any craft. You can knit, you can crochet, you can sew, you can quilt. I don't care. Um, you can support any charity. And remember, charity is a pretty broad description. It doesn't have to be an official charity. It can be something like what I do, which um, I just take scrap yarn or, or acrylic, you know, just acrylic yarn that I happen to have. And I started making hats. And then also, remember the the ripple scarves that everybody was making a few years ago. I had a whole bunch of yarn like this because my mom really thought they were neat and they were kind of all the rage. So I have a bunch of this yarn left. Um, when my mother, uh, toward, at the end of her life, um, she was staying in a, initially it was a, for a rehab uh facility, but it became pretty obvious that she wasn't going to be able to go home. Um, she had had an episode of sepsis, and sometimes, I guess, in older people, sepsis can trigger dementia. And while she was staying there, it became pretty clear that dementia had sort of taken over, and she was not going to be able to stay home alone anymore. So she was probably going to end up staying as a permanent resident in this facility. And it was, it's, you know, we all kind of have a preconception of what nursing facilities are like. And in some cases, sadly, that is borne out. 
However, I will say about this one, um, it was probably it's probably one of the nicest ones I've ever been in. Um, they had a facility dog that lived there. They let me bring my mom's little dog, Feathers, who you saw a couple of weeks ago. All I had to do was show them one time that she had had her vaccination. So I just had to go get the paperwork from the vet. And um, also, too, after my mom had passed away, they asked me if I would bring one of my horses down. And they brought the residents out to pet the horse, which was really cool. Um and I heard some wonderful stories that day of people remembering what it was like to uh, have horses or live on a farm. So it was a really neat experience. Um, so what I was going to say is what I started doing after my mom had passed away, um, I started making hats and then scarves because I remember I would go eat lunch or dinner with her and I had made her a scarf like this and the lady that she was staying with in the room had been admiring it. So these, as you know, if you've ever made these, they take absolutely no time. You can literally make one of these in about an hour. So while we were sitting there talking, I made her one. I happened to have some extra yarn and I made her one and gave it to her and it just made her so happy. So uh, what I started doing was making, you know, some hats and making some of these scarves and just putting them in uh, Christmas bags and then doing some Christmas cards up. Now, what I've started doing is having cards. When I have every December, I have a wreath making party at my farm where people come and can make, you know, evergreen wreaths for the holiday season. And I started having boxes of cards and people at the party. I don't charge anything for this party. I just invite people that want to come. I said, you know, your, your way to pay me back for doing this is fill out some cards for some of these people. And so we take a stack of cards and, a st and some hats and things down to the nursing home where my mom was at. Um, just because, you know, there's some people that probably don't have a lot of family or their family lives far away uh, and they wouldn't have very much Christmas. So I always try to take some things uh, down there. And I'm only talking about this on here because I know nobody that works there will watch this, but I don't even, I don't, I don't do this where they know who I am. I just show up, I hand them the box and I leave. Um, now used to, well, I say that if they thought about it, they probably figured out who I am. But, um, anyway, so that's what I do. So, so even something like that would work. Um, I know on the group, I've seen some really cool ideas for hats and scarves for children that are going to age out of the foster system. Uh, I know a friend of mine is crocheting blankets for, um, preemie babies. I know that somebody is making uh, cat beds for a cat shelter or a humane or animal shelter. So I'm pretty open-minded as to what um, charity means. I would just like to know what it is that you're going to do just because I think it's neat to see. So we do have some prizes. I showed part of them last week. We have some beautiful project bags and notions accessory type kits from Tesla Knits. Jasmine at Tesla Knits has given me four bags, which is amazing. Um, there's some yarn that was donated uh, through Paradise Fibers. And then I'm going to donate one pattern of the winner's choice up to $10 in value on Ravelry. So please feel free to check that out. Oh, and before I forget, Leon Alexander Yarns is, Logan is going to send me some yarn also, and his yarn is really beautiful. So please check that out. I would encourage you to go to the Ravelry group and check out those uh, forums or uh, those to discussion topics under my forum. Love to have you join in. Um, the more the merrier. Can't do enough good in this world, right? So yeah. So now we'll talk about finished objects. Okay, guys, um, I didn't get nearly as much done this last week as I meant to. I had big plans for the weekend. I had my service learning project kind of come to a culmination this weekend on Saturday. And I'll talk more about that when we get to the part about physics and science type stuff. But um, I had really planned on getting a lot done. I was going to have all Saturday afternoon and all day Sunday to uh, work on my two knit-alongs that I'm involved, mystery knit-alongs that I'm doing. And Saturday, I came home, I had stopped, I was really hungry, and I thought, I'm going to stop and I'm going to treat myself to one of my favorite places to eat. And I don't know if that was what did it or what, but I came home and I laid down for about an hour and I woke up and I felt like I had been hit by a truck and I felt like that there were dinosaurs fighting inside my stomach. 
Um, and so most of Saturday night, I was sick. All day Sunday, I felt terrible. Uh, I think the polite way to put it is gastrointestinal distress. <laughs> Uh, to the point that I did not go to work today. I messaged my classes or emailed my classes last night with a very detailed email about the plan for the week. And I just, I didn't do anything. I, and that is not like me. I, well, I didn't do anything. I took care of my animals and that was it. I got up, I went out, I fed, I watered, and I went straight back to bed. And I slept probably, you know, a good 30 of the last 48 hours. Um, anyway, I'm feeling quite a bit better uh, this afternoon. I um, finally ate something and I'm, I drank some kombucha. I had gone to town and got myself a Diet Coke. And it makes me kind of feel bad because all the other podcasters have their nice tea cups and their ceramic mugs and their tea. And I'm drinking out of my 99 cent large drink Sonic <laughs> But hey, whatever works, you know. Uh, so I drank my Diet Coke and I had some uh, raspberry kombucha in the refrigerator. And I figured since it's a fermented beverage and I just had some stomach issues, I thought it might be good to drink that to kind of reset my gut um, healthy flora. So I'm drinking that right now. Um, but sorry, I don't have the fancy cup. I've just got the large Sonic drink. <laughs> Anyway, I did get one thing finished, and it goes with the same little thing that I showed last week. I made myself another bunny. This is a Prince and Peddler pattern. Let me get the pattern here, and I'll show you. This is a Prince and Peddler pattern um, that was available for free um, on Easter Sunday. And, and, it, and if, even if it's not still free, their patterns only usually cost less than three dollars they're available on ravelry i didn't even check to see if this was still free but it's by prince and peddler there's their little logo and it's a really quick little bunny so i had made one already so i made another one and i'm gonna make i've got another one started i'm gonna try to make about four of these to enter them in the happy knits yolanda's happy knits podcast um she's having a make-along called the spring fling and she'll take knitting or crocheting and, but you have to use 50 grams of yarn. So to qualify, I need to make three or four of these little guys. Because they're about 15 grams each. So if I make four, that'll be 60 grams. And that'll get me over the, the hump. The yarn is just some scrap yarn that somebody gave me. But I thought it was really cute. I thought it looked like jelly beans. So, um, yeah. So I thought they were really cute. So I did get this little guy finished. And I've got another one about a third of the way done. Um, too. So I did get that done this week. And there is one other thing that I got finished this week. Let me reach up here and get it. Willie, you're going to have to get down for me, okay? Can you jump down? Okay, let me get this. Okay, so this is the other thing that I finished. I made my pen storage apparatus. <laughs> I showed this last week. Uh, this was my mom's embroidery hoop that she used to use for cross stitching. And then this is part, I was trying to figure out what I was going to use for my backing because I knew I wanted it to be more than just one layer of fabric so it would have some, uh, some body to it. So this is actually uh, part of an old saddle pad that was worn out. I was thinking about it and thinking about it and I had a saddle pad in my horse trailer and I knew it had, it was to the point where it didn't work very well as a saddle pad, but it had sections in it that were still good. So I threw it in the washing machine and then I cut a section out of it. And since saddle, English saddle pads are made with some thickness to them, but they're not as thick as say Western saddle pads, it works perfectly. I just trimmed it to fit and then I've put my pins on it, okay? And then I just had some scrap ribbon that I'm using to tie through the hoop to hang it up. So that took me all of five minutes to do. Probably eventually I should run a bead of hot glue maybe around the back of this just to hold it in place. But right now it seems to be working okay. Um, but when I get a whole bunch of pins on there, it might not work so well. But anyway, I thought this was a great kind of unique uh, way to hold my pins. I had seen some people on um, Instagram and on some other podcasts um, that had suggested something like this. So I thought it was really cool. Uh, I've pointed out most of these pins before. The only diff new additions that are on here are the ones that are here. And these are from just some different parks and things that I have been to. 
Uh, this is Ponca Elk Education Center in the Buffalo National River and then Longhorn Caverns. The Buffalo National River is where the Ponca Elk Education Center is, and that's about one of my favorite places in the world to go. It's just, it's about an hour and a half for me, and it was America's first national wild river. Um, beautiful, just magical place to be, especially what I would call the Upper Buffalo. Um, it's just an amazingly beautiful place with amazingly beautiful this time of year the wildflowers there's the elk herds up there there's caves up there of course the caves are all blocked off because of white nose syndrome we have five species of bats that nest here and and also overwinter here that are highly endangered so um, anyway i love the buffalo river and then um, this is a pin my first pin from the wings over arkansas program where you observe um, Arkansas birds and you can send in and get certificates. I don't know where my other pins are. I know I've got at least two more. I need to hunt those up. They may be at work because they, they send you, if you send in your checklist, you get a really beautiful certificate and a pin. I'm more about that later. And then that's my ivory build woodpecker pin because I've been fascinated with those things for years. And a few years ago, remember NPR had a story about where they thought they had seen one down in the big woods in Southeast Arkansas and they heard the double knock sound that it made so i believe <laughs> anyway the rest of these i think i have shown on the podcast oh no there's one more this is the oni pin from the smithsonian oni was sort of the mascot of the u.s postal service for a lot of years he would travel on the postal trains and people he had a little jacket that he wore and people would put stamps on his little jacket of where all the places that he had been um, and I, so when I was at the Smithsonian a few years ago, when we were on a, a trip uh, for work, uh, I went, I got this book about him and a little pen. So anyway, so that's my storage uh, mechanism for my pens. So I did get that finished too. Okay, so that's all the finished objects that I have uh, for this week. Um, I'm going to show you my two works in progress. Again, these are the mystery knit-alongs. They are the Lunar Phase Mystery Knit-Along by Larissa Brown. And which is in the fourth week. I'm still working on week three. <laughs> in the fourth week. And then the Helen Stewart Curious Handmade Impressionist Mystery Knit Along, which we are in the third week, and I'm almost finished with week two. So I'm going to show you those. If you don't want to see those, I will include an uh, image with a timestamp on it that you can um, fast forward to if you don't want to see those too. So I'll include that here. Okay, guys, so here's my first one. I'm doing the Lunar Phase Mystery Knit Along uh, by Larissa Brown. And we are in the fourth week of it, but I am still finishing the week three clue. Um, I'm about, I would guess I'm about halfway through on the week three clue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the first three weeks and then, um, yeah. So the first week's clue is here. Okay, and I've just left it on the needles because you're supposed to put it off on waste yarn. I just left it on the needles. So this is the, the week one piece. Okay, so it's sort of a hat. It's sort of a quarter of a circle wedge. Okay. And then this was week two. So this represented the first quarter moon. Then this was week two. And you can't really tell as much about it because my needle cord is not as long. But this is a half circle piece. Okay, so this is representing the full moon, moon phase. The one I'm working on right now is going to be the same wedge piece as the first week, but it's lighter in color. I've been looking at the spoiler images, and it's really neat to see the way she's got color playing together here. So um, this is how far along I am on that piece. Okay, you can kind of see. I am almost done. I've got, well, I'm about halfway through section two, so I've got sections three and four to go, but it's going to be lighter, you can already tell, and I did make one little mistake right here in my eyelets. I had forgotten to do my knit, I'd forgotten to do an initial knit section on the beginning of each row, and I, I should have waited to fix it till I got up here, but yeah. That way I won't anger the gods by having a perfect piece, right? But anyway, and then the last week, we put these three together um, into the shawl. And I've already read ahead on the directions. Uh, it's going to be an interesting construction. Um, uses a, well, 
It uses three needle bind off for a portion of it. I already looked that up, so I've kind of got it in my mind how I want to do that. But anyway, so um, this is by Larissa Brown. The yarn is by Six and Seven Fiber. And um, I'm keeping that in my Darn Yarn MN Constellations bag. So I hope, I'm going to kind of focus on this, I think, for the rest of the week and try to get it done. And then I'll be behind on the Helen Stewart one, but, you know, they get done when they get done. It's not like there's a race and, and you know, frankly, the odds aren't that good that I'm going to win a prize anyway because there's so many people doing it. So I'm not really, I mean, really, that's the only really motivation to be done by the end of the deadline. So I'll get done when I get done. I'm not going to stress out about it and I will get them done. Um, because I don't want to start any more sort of shawl size projects until I get those finished. So that's my Lunar Phase Mystery Knit Along by Larissa Brown. Okay, then in my really cute little playful otters bag by April 9 Designs on Etsy. I keep my tags on here. I guess I'm a little bit like Minnie Pearl. April 9 Designs. And she just put up some really cute new Notions Pouch combos with some needle keepers that I'm eyeballing. I'll have to see. I've got to pay farm insurance this month, so that may be where my spending money goes, but if not, I may get me one of those because they're fairly reasonably priced. Um, I just am up to the point, for those of y'all who are doing this in the last week's clue, where you're starting the lace section and you add all your stitch markers. I just actually did that this morning. Like I said, I did not do Squatola this weekend. I, all I did was sleep and watch um, Netflix. I watched Todrick Hall's new documentary. If you haven't seen that and you like Todrick Hall, it is very definitely worth watching. But anyway, so um, this is how far I am on that. And you can kind of see the introduction of the third color. I think these colors are working really well together. Uh, I like the fact that there is a little bit of contrast in them, but not so much that they look, don't look like they all kind of marry together. Um, well, so I'm pretty pleased with my color choices. Stephanie at my local yarn shop knit two together helped me pick those out. Okay. Uh, and I've got my little progress keeper on there. I will say anytime you buy a bag uh, from April 9 Designs, she always includes a progress keeper uh, with her bag that kind of complements the bag. And her bags are excellent value for money. So I highly encourage you to check out her Etsy shop. I'll link it down in the information. But anyway, I've just gone, I'm literally just did the row where you add all the, all the stitch markers. And I'm so proud of myself because I am on the correct stitch count. <laughs> Major victory, right? I mean, this sucker's gonna be 72 miles long when it's done. It may only be a mile wide, but it's gonna be 72 miles long. It's kind of like the state of Tennessee. It's 15 minutes wide and 30, 15 hours long. When you're driving through it, it seems like. But anyway, so, um, yeah. So, that's my... Um, oh, I should mention the yarns here. I'm sorry. Um, the light-colored yarn and the green, the pale yarn, my pale color, my color number one and the green are both Primrose Yarn Company. And then my dark one is Kimmery Knit Next. The light-colored one is Heads Will Roll. The green color is Maple Leaf. And then the dark one is called Area 51. So, um, I'm going to focus on my moon phase one to get it kind of knocked out, and then I'll focus on this one after that. So, I've only got about, I think about 14 more rows, or maybe 13 more rows to go on last week's clue, so I'm not feeling too stressed out. It'll be all right. Like I said, it gets done when it gets done. I, I'm, I'm not going to put any false pressure on myself. So, that's my two works in progress for this week. Um, so, we'll come back, and I'll talk about kind of what's up next in the on my future future crafting <laughs> okay guys sort of my uh future crafting that i want to do i've got to get started on my uh knitting expat socks she's i'm part of the wanderlust sock club and she's been releasing releasing excuse me a pattern um, every other month. So the Wanderlust Club was January, March, May, so the odd-numbered months. And so at the beginning of March, she entered, released the Derive socks, okay? And um, I haven't started them yet, so I'm, I'm absolutely going to cast these on probably tonight just because I need to mentally get started on them. Um, 
Now the grocery girls this month are doing their extra bonus entry for their sock club or their socks of the month. So for April is striping. And I happen to have another ball of this Peyton's Croy sock, okay? And this colorway is called Brown Rose Marl. So I believe it's going to stripe up the way it looks like it's dyed. It's going to stripe up. So I think this will get me a bonus entry. Now, I fussed about this yarn quite a bit, but I've been watching Jasmine from Tesla Knits Instagram, and she's been having pretty good luck with it. So as I said, I'm going to try my Luca needles again. This is... Um, I've, I've used these before and had pretty good luck with them, so I'm hoping that the combination of the needle and the yarn will work better than it did on those um, cereal socks that I did. So I'm going to cast those on probably tonight. I'm going to do them toe up uh, using following the tutorial method of Yolanda at Happy Knits. She has a really good um, two at a time toe up sock tutorial on her on her. Um, a channel so I really suggest if you're interested in doing that to go watch her channel um, she's got also some other tutorials about a new increase method that she's learned and then also uh, afterthought heel um, tutorial also and her tutorials are very very clear I highly recommend you go look at them uh, that's Yolanda at Happy Knits and I'll link her information uh, down in the information bar this is in my two at a time sock sack this is also an April 9 design designs bag. It's got a nice center pocket here that acts as a partition for two at a time socks. This is an April 9 designs bag also. Okay, it's very well made. And then this one happens to have a little llama progress keeper with it. So again, April 9 designs on Etsy. I really think highly of her bags. Um, so go check those out. Now, my other um, future crafting, i am decided that I need sort of a palette cleanser after doing these two mystery knit-alongs. So I'm going to shift gears and I'm going to do a crochet project. And you've heard me talk about this before. This is the Kraken Shawl by uh, Two Hearts Crochet. She released a tutorial on how to do these tassels. So I'm going to get me a tassel maker and then I'll be ready to go on this. But when I finish, finish these two mystery knit along shawls, I'm going to do this Kraken shawl next. Um, you learn, you're going to have to learn to read Pico crochet charts, which I've looked at and I've kind of got it figured out. Um, luckily, they are not as directional dependent as most knitting charts. And we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. I finally sat down and drew out some diagrams to show you what I'm talking about. So, this is the Kraken Shawl by Two Hearts Crochet. She has an Etsy shop, uh, so I encourage you to go check her out. She is the one who did the um, Solar System Crochet Along Blanket, and she provided that for free. So, I was more than happy to um, spend some money with her on some of her patterns. This is the yarn I'm going to use. This is by um, Kama Sutra. Kama Sutra Fiber Arts. She is in Maryland, I believe. I know her through a mutual friend on Facebook. Um, my friend Ray is in Maine, but I believe Rue is in Maryland. Or maybe Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Uh, this is the yarn I'm going to use for this. This is called the Northern Lights set. And this is her Merino Cashmere Nylon base. And the colors in this are just delicious <laughs> i could not love this these colors more at all and i mean truly the northern lights is a perfect name for this yarn now she picked me out two that have a little bit more solid in for the kraken and then some that have a little bit more green in for the water the shawl is a dk white shawl and this is fingering so i'm going to hold it double to do my shawl so um yeah, I'm excited, excited, excited to get to making that. Uh, a lady that I follow on uh, Instagram, Ulis Mating, I'm, I'm probably saying that wrong, but uh, she is a German uh, crafter, and she has already made it, and hers turned out really pretty. So um, I'm excited to see how mine turns out. I was kind of following her progress on hers. So uh, that's sort of my future crafting that I want to do. So let's come back and talk about some acquisitions.
Okay, so um, a few acquisitions. Um, I got my ball winder and my Swift. Uh, Stephanie, I went by the shop the other day and visited with her for a little bit. And um, she got my ball winder and Swift in, but you guys all know what one of those looks like, so I'm not going to show that. But yay, so no more hand winding uh, yarn. So I'm pretty excited about that. So some uh, acquisitions that I have. Now, I, as I mentioned, I'm doing the Lunar Phase Mystery Knit Along. Well, when they were doing the signups for this, there are a couple of different things that you could buy to kind of go along with that. And I'll show the stitch markers next week because I forgot to get those out. But I got my pen, finally. This is my pen, and it's the same as that sticker that I showed. It's a ball of yarn that's the moon, a crescent moon there. And this is by Wild Hunt Designs. Okay, Wild Hunt Designs. So that's one of my pens that I just got. And then another pin that I got, uh, Natel Draws Stuff, was working with the Endangered Wolf Center, and they were doing a sort of a joint project where she designed a pin, and there was also a tote bag. I believe the tote bags are getting close to being sold out. I'd like to get one, but you have to kind of watch your, your dollars every now and then, so I didn't get one yet. But um, she did design this beautiful pin, and I believe this wolf's name is Reba. And 20% of the profits from this pen went to the Endangered Wolf Center. Okay, so let's see if I can get that to focus. Okay, so there's that beautiful pen by Natel Draws Stuff. Okay, and she is on Instagram. So this, this was a collaboration with the Endangered Wolf Center, and that same design is what's on the tote bags that you could get. Okay. Um, so, also, there is another, um, maker on Instagram that I follow, KWT Designs, and she had, I believe it's a she, I shouldn't say that, uh, I don't know for sure, I believe so, but, um, this designer had some pens that I really enjoyed, and what attracted my attention initially was this pen, which is, I believe she called it the Eclipse Snake. It's got all the different phases of the moon on it. I know not everybody likes snakes, but I don't mind snakes. I know snakes have their place in the environment. In fact, <laughs> I probably shouldn't tell this. I was in the backyard the other day, and the dogs were kind of having a fit, and a really big black rat snake was climbing up a tree limb, and he proceeded to find a hole in the eave of my house and go into my attic. So I have a snake in the attic. I used to have a rat snake that lived under my house for years. He used to come out and drink out of the dog's water trough. And he would hear me out there filling it up. And he would come out the air vent. And he would sit there and watch me fill it up. And then get himself a drink or herself a drink and go back under there. Most people around here would freak smooth out about that. Snakes don't bother me. I know they have their place in the environment. So this is the first pin that I got from them. And then this pin is Laika, the first dog in space. She was a dog from the Soviet Union that was launched in an orbiter. Now, I bought this pen sort of as a tribute to her because there was no plan for her to come back alive. And I liked what the person who designed this pen had to say about, you know, we use the life on this planet, and sometimes I understand we have to do things to advance. You know, there is a cost to scientific advancement, and we just need to be cognizant of that. Um, I saw a really cool uh, article, or actually it was a podcast, about how maybe, you know, within the next decade, you know, stem cell research and learning to grow tissues and tissue cultures and labs will drastically reduce the amount of animal testing that needs to be done uh, in labs, and I can't wait for that day. Um, also, too, there was a really interesting, I follow a Facebook page called The Credible Hulk, <laughs> not The Incredible, but The Credible Hulk, and there was an article about, you know, we can now create, use genetically modified bacteria to create insulin in labs to help people with diabetes where in the 50s it had to be made usually from pig pancreases so you know it took 
some ridiculous number of pan pig pancreases to get a small amount of insulin and now we can of course do that much more efficiently in the lab. One of the things that I talk about in my classes is the important, importance of not letting words that we use in science be taken over by popular media and used in an incorrect way. And one of those, you know, my, my least favorite one is theory. You know, it's just a theory. What a scientific theory is in the it's just a theory quotation marks statement are two very, very different things that most people don't realize that. And the word GMO is a word that has a lot of fear around it. And one of these days I will talk about how we don't need to be that fearful of that word. Do we need to be aware of what's going on with our food supply? Absolutely. But the fact is... The way farming is right now, this planet cannot support the population of people that we have on it without doing something like GMOs. That's just fact. Um, so we're either going to have to change the way we grow food or we're going to have to let people go hungry. And I think the choice there is pretty clear. Anyway, didn't mean to talk about all that in acquisition. So Laika, the Soviet space dog, you know, let her not be forgotten. Okay, so <laughs> now that we've kind of got on a heavy subject, um, the other day I was in the thrift store. I had um, supposed to had some appointments in town on Thursday and they got canceled. So I ended up going by my very favorite thrift store and doing a little bit of poking around. And I found a comforter bag of fabric. And I kind of looked at it and went, Okay, well, when I unpacked it all, there was a huge amount of fabric in there, and I think I paid 10 or $12 for it. So, um, I'll just show you a couple of the highlights of the fabric that I got. Now, the first thing that I noticed was this set of fabric that is all, looks like, very clearly supposed to coordinate with each other. So, there's the black print that's got the birds on it, sort of the big focus print, and then there is... The sort of the mid-scale print, and then this one is folded the wrong way, but I'll try to flip it open where you can see it. The smaller scale print. And these all coordinate together. See? So that looks like project bag material to me, doesn't it, to y'all? I think that'll be some great project bags. So, um, you know, maybe use... One of these is the lining, probably this one because there's more of it, and then maybe this is a kind of a contrast bottom or something like that. So that was the first thing that I dug out of the bag. Then there were some other things too, but one of, the, one of the main reasons that I bought it, and this will not be a surprise to anyone, there was a whole bunch of dog fabric in there. So there was this Halloween print with all the Halloween doggies on it. And there were several other prints. There was this one. And there's not a lot of any of these, but there's plenty to do something cute with. Okay. So whoever had this fabric was clearly a dog lover, which that's great. I'm proud to have found this. So anyway, there was like eight or ten of these different... Um, and that kind of coordinates with that one. It's got woof woof and bark bark all over it. So those kind of coordinate together. And then, um, you know, there's this one that's really cute too. So I found these in there also. And then there's just kind of a big all over print of puppies. Okay. So I found those in that bag also. And there were some other coordinating prints. Now, in a separate area, I found rolled up just to, for sale kind of as a remnant, I guess. Um, I saw the print on this and I thought, well, that'll look really cool in my kitchen. When I opened it up, I realized what it was. It's this. It is an unsewn muslin bag for grits. <laughs> so it's got the stamp up here in the top that leads me to believe that it's just an unsewn bag. The other reason I think that instead of being an all over print, the back side of it's plain, which is what you would find in a, in a commercial bag. So I found there's actually two of these. Uh, I have a friend whose name is Robin, and I'm going to send her one to give to her mother. So um, anyway, so I thought those were really cute. And this is from a company in Nashville that makes these bags. So I thought that was just really neat. I think I may just cut that out and hem it and hang it in my kitchen. I thought that was a neat find. For 25 cents, you bet. I think that was a great find. 
Now, um, a few podcasts back, I talked about the really bad day that I had about the little dog. Okay. Well, I had wandered, you know, into the fabric store and had the fabric buying nanny. What I failed to mention was after that, I went to the yarn store and I was just kind of, you know, I don't know what I was thinking, but I was just kind of in a daze and I went in there and I just started looking at yarn, picking out stuff. Oh, excuse me. Willie wants up here, um, picking out stuff and my eyes lit upon this skein of yarn. And I saw the name of it. It's called Bird Set Free. And it is Primrose Yarn Company. And this is their Sophia base, which is an MCN. Okay, I'm using that in my Helen Stewart. Not this same colorway, but this same base. And then I went over to the other side where the Kim Marie section is. And I found these two. Okay, and this one is Fancy Game of Clue. And then this one is Area 51 again. So I'm actually using this particular colorway in my uh, Mystery Knit Along shawl. Okay, so you can kind of see it a little bit better there. All right, and these are both uh, 7525. Yeah, 7525. Now, I think these would all work well together. I don't have a clue what pattern I'm going to make out of them. I didn't really care. I was just. I don't know if y'all get like this, but like I've mentioned multiple times, I'm kind of a depression shopper and I was really sad and I guess I was just trying to make myself feel better. So this was not all I bought in there that day. But anyway, <laughs> support your local yarn shop, right? So, um, but this one has got some interesting colors. It's got some blue, or not blue, but green and brown and turquoise and uh, magenta speckling it's basically got these colors in it in speckling so i thought those would go well together and then this has the, sort of these colors in it as accents so i thought these three might work well together for something i don't know what yet i know there's a lot, ton of options out there i just haven't sort of zoned in that's for way on down the road though those are those will just hang out in the storage bag in the tub um, until I decide what I'm going to do with them. But, yeah. So, support your local yarn shop. <laughs> okay, so that's pretty much all of my acquisitions. So, that's sort of the end of the crafting content. I'm going to go on and talk about um, some science stuff. Or, no, it's not, actually. I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk a little bit about... Uh, I've mentioned a few times on the differences in reading charts for me, so I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about how I read knitting charts as a left-handed knitter. Okay, guys, I've mentioned this a few times before, and most, um, a lot of knitting patterns, particularly ones that have lace in them, very often have knitting charts. And I'm trying to learn to read charts. I'm having an easier time learning to read knitting charts than I am crocheting charts, to be honest. I haven't yet mastered the skill of reading crocheting charts. Um, but I thought I would show you a segment of a pattern that I made and show you kind of how I had to approach it. Now, I did ask permission from the pattern writer to use this. This is a free pattern available on Ravelry. But I will credit uh, the pattern maker. And this is by... Olivia from This Handmade Life, and this is one of her sock patterns, and it is a free sock pattern on Ravelry. So, um, so let's say when you, when you look at a lace pattern, so don't read my writing just yet, <laughs> okay, when you look at a lace pattern, okay, I just redrew part, like about a few rows of the, the, the pattern, this is not the whole pattern, but, you know, they're numbered, one, three, five, now this one you knit you you do a pattern row and then there's a row of knit a pattern row a row of knit and so on okay now we know and then these are the columns all right so you know that for knitting in the round you know the numbers are all on one side or if you, you if you've got numbers on both sides that's for knitting flat okay so when you look at this this is there's a couple of things going on here the marks are supposed to mimic what the stitch looks like okay so First of all, this pattern is written cuff down for right-handed knitters. 
So what a what a cuff down. So in the red arrows, for cuff down, right handed, you start from the bottom. Okay, and you read right to left. Okay, so you start from the bottom and you work up the chart, and you read right to left. So the red arrow is a right-handed top-down person. Now I am left-handed, so if I were going to do top-down, all I would need to do is read left to right across the chart, but I would still read bottom up. Okay, so I would read just like you would read a book, left to right, but I would go up the chart also. Because I do things toe up, I have to read the chart top down. So I actually think I have an advantage because I get to read it just like I'm reading it on the page. Left to right, top to bottom. Okay. Now the other thing that I have to consider is a right leaning decrease. So like these guys right here. Okay. For a right handed person, that's a knit two together. Okay. Because they're moving right to left across the yarn. Because I'm moving left to right across the yarn, and the way I would knit into the stitch, to get a right leaning decrease, I have to do a slip slip knit. Okay, so what I do when I get a chart, or let me go on, so a left leaning decrease for a let, righty is a slip slip knit, and for me, it's a knit two together. So, my dominant, what for my dominant hand, my the way I try to think about it is, for the dominant hand, the dominant hand decrease direction is always a knit two together. I don't know if that helps, but anyway. So what I do when I get a pattern, the first thing I do is I go through and I look at the if a chart and I figure out left or right or, or does it even matter or just or whatever. And then I go through and I exchange knit two together and slip slip knit everywhere. The other thing is, is I go through, and if I'm knitting a pair of socks, say, and it's a chart, then I, if I'm doing toe-up socks, then I will draw arrows to indicate which way I'm supposed to be going so that I know that. Okay? Now, it's not really that big of a deal. My only issue is, you know, I figured this out just by luck. You know, nobody makes you really think about which way your decreases go based on your dominant hand. And so, you know, people who don't think about this kind of stuff, I'm sure get a little bit frustrated. The other thing is, and I don't know why this torques me off the way that it does, but people are like, oh, well, I'm left-handed, but I was made to learn to knit right-handed. Why? <laughs> That's kind of like, you know, used to in school, if you were right left-handed, they'd hit you with a ruler over your knuckles to make you stop and make you learn to write right-handed. Why? If you're left-handed, you're left-handed. Big deal. Learn to deal with. Learn to, people need to learn to deal with that. That, that. I don't know. That bugs me for some reason. Oh, well, they made me learn to knit right-handed. Oh, they made me learn to write right-handed. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. There's a lot of left-handed people out there. The world needs to learn that we're out there. So, I mean, I, you know, like I said, as far as pattern writers go, I don't know that there's anything easily that can be done unless they just refer to this as a left-leaning or a right-leaning decrease, and then people had to figure out what that was, which I realize 90% probably of people looking at the, well, probably not 90%, probably 75% of people are right-handed or knit right-handed, but there's a chunk of us out there that knit left-handed, and I have actually found some websites um, that have um, left-handed information on it. And in fact, I just started following a lady on Instagram who is a left-handed knitter. She also makes sock blockers, which are really pretty. I want to get some. But anyway, so this is kind of an idea. And I did ask permission to sort of copy down part of this chart. That's just a mistake that I made right there. That's not some weird stitch. Uh, but anyway, so that's kind of the, the calculus that I have to do before I start knitting a pattern is I have to go through and look at where the decreases are and are they meant to make a design and if I want to get the design to come out correctly, what do I need to have to do for my own self to adapt that pattern so that my, my stuff will look correct at the end. So, yeah, so now that's the end of the knitty content or the crafting content. So if that's all you're here for, I'll maybe see you next time. And if not, um, stick around and we'll talk about some other stuff.
Okay, guys, as I mentioned already, um, the service learning project happened this weekend. Uh, we had been working up to this all semester. It was a a day long experience that we're, we call Super Science Saturday. And this is actually the fourth time we've done it. I think I said it was just the third time the last time I talked about it, but this is the fourth time we've done it. Um, what service learning is, is it's a way to get your students involved in the community in some way. Uh, but they also, there is a learning component for them too. It's not just simply community service. You have to have that learning piece for your students also. So what I have done is I do what's called direct service learning where my students actually provide a direct service to a community partner by having this science camp. And I tie it into my classes because we do a whole semester long discussion about public scholarship. And it's not just public scholarship about being a very learned intelligent person you know it's being able to communicate science on a lot of levels to people um, you know you can be the smartest person in the world and if you can't communicate your ideas to the public then you know how are you going to win people over for funding or, or keep people of being fearful from what it is you're trying to do or handle uh, public relations situations or just communicate to clients or patients or whatever. So public scholarship, I feel like, is is pretty important and it's a skill that you can learn and you can always improve on it. So um, we come at this service learning project as a way to do that, but to also break some stereotypes about what special needs means. You know, um, a lot of people have a preconception of special needs kids that's in a lot of ways kind of negative, particularly when it comes to intellectual ability. And what you find out very quickly is that's not the case, okay? Um, they may look at the world a little bit differently, but most of these kids, you know, that we deal with are sharp as tacks. Just because, say, for example, they're on the autism spectrum, you know, and they may have trouble um, expressing themselves in written language uh, and so a lot of times they're kind of seen as uh, slow learners with and very often they their language is science and math and so we do this to try to I do this also to try to break some of these preconceptions with my students of what it means to to have you know an autism spectrum condition or um, to be you know wheelchair bound but that doesn't mean that you're that you're stupid. I mean, you know, I mean, I hate to say it like that, but you know how you see people that, I don't know, and, and, and most of the time people mean well, but they start kind of talking down or start talking to someone, you know, in a way that's sort of a little bit childlike or insulting. And I think that what my students find out is these are just kids. I mean, they're just kids and, and that's all they are. And they have a great time and they have a good time and they fully engage in the activities and, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. So we spend all semester sort of planning activities, and they have to be activities that the students can teach a lesson, whether it's we had, for example, a density column where one of my students took different materials like dish soap and cooking oil and syrup and honey and, and different fluids and put them in a test tube and they were different colors so you could see how they stacked up kind of like your salad dressing you know your italian salad dressing when you buy it the oil and the vinegar very often will separate and you have to shake it up that's because it's a different density so you shake it up and then it, it becomes more homogeneous but um, they made a density column. They did um, catapults made out of marshmallows and barbecue skewers. And then they did, we had a, a snap circuit station where they could put together these little simple battery powered electrical circuits. And then we had a robot station where they made a, there was an obstacle course. It was supposed to be like Mars where they drove the, they drove the, um, the robots through the obstacle course. So there were a lot of different activities. Most of them had a take home component to the kids. And then at the end, I did a planetarium show for everybody. So that was this weekend. Um, it went really well. We had 25 kids signed up, but I think only about 17 or 18 actually made it. There's always usually a few no shows. Um, but it went great and my students did well. I was really pleased with how it turned out. Um, 
you know, it's always to me, I mean, I know I hate to use this word because it's kind of become a cliche, but it's a real blessing to see the interaction with my students and these kids. So I took some pictures and I've put them together in a short video clip that I'm going to insert here so you can watch that. opportunities in some unexpected places. Now I don't know what the park systems are or the heritage systems are um, where you live but I know here in Arkansas we have Arkansas State Parks, we have the Arkansas Department of Natural Heritage, we have the Game and Fish Commission, we have different local uh, nonprofits, and in a lot of cases these places offer wonderful rich learning opportunities. I have mentioned the OWLS program which is Outdoor Women Learning Skills. It's hosted by Sasha at our local state park and I've also mentioned the basket classes that they do. If you look for example on our Arkansas State Parks website there are classes really interesting and unique classes offered at many of our state parks on everything from basket making, candle making, soap making, to how to drive horses and harness, how to flint nap arrows, um, in some cases even how to uh, make a recurve bow. So the OWLS program um, is something that goes on once a month for six months. It's Outdoor Women Learning Skills and this month's class was birding. Now it is not not a free program. It is a it, there is a cost to it, but you did you do get a meal out of it. She does fix supper and dessert for us, and then you get some neat materials. So um, this month it was birding. So uh, one of the some of the things that we got these are published by our local game and fish commission, and there are several of these different pamphlets. But these are the two that we got: Arkansas backyard birds and Arkansas waterfowl. And inside it's like a small field guide that's specifically tailored to uh, this particular, you know, these particular birds, okay, with some beautiful color pictures, all right, and then the backyard birds one is kind of along the same lines, okay, so, and it's got some field marks and stuff like that in it, and then uh, we also got the Arkansas Autobahn Society checklist, so you can mark off your birds that you've seen, and there's information in there about how, what season, and how often it appears and all of that. So this is one of our checklists. Now I have an older version of one of these that I put a lot of my markings on, but I'll sort of save this one to transfer. And then last but not least, cause you know I love the interesting little, she gave us a little journal notebook and this is holographic on the front. It kind of looks 3D. So that was some things that we got at the OWLS program. But I really encourage you to check those things out. If you're a lifelong learner like I am, there's some really cool things that can be learned. Uh, some other things, other classes that I've taken, and um, this was through the Arkansas Master Naturalist Program, but you can also find programs like these at the state parks. And, you know, it's springtime now, and the wildflowers are blooming. So this is a book I wanted to share with you. This is one of my favorite field guides. This is the Ozark Wildflowers book by Don Kurz. And the reason I like this book is most field guides are taxonomically organized. This one is, if you're not so sure about taxonomy it's organized by flower color so if you can identify the color of the flower then you can narrow down where in the book it might be and then go from there because I know some plant taxonomy but I'm not great at it so that's why I like this particular book this is a falcon guide publication and it's for the Ozarks so it's that region circled there Okay, um, so that's why I like this book because it's got things organized by color. 
And so that helps me when I'm out. And then it then it goes through, and they're I think within color they're organized in bloom order. So the spring ephemeral wildflowers are first, and then they come, you know, in order past that, um, just you know through the year. So you know, for example, right now in my yard I have these guys, I have Johnny jump ups blooming in my yard. Okay, uh, so as you browse through here, you can find um, you can find you know the different plants that are blooming in your area, and see you know it kind of helps you narrow down what that thing might be. So um, anyway, so you know if you're interested in flowers, this is an excellent t style of book, and maybe for your area they have one too. So I really encourage you to check it out. I think I actually bought this at the bookstore at my local state park. So, um, yeah, so lifelong learning is really, to me, is really important. Um, and there's lots of resources out there to help you learn. Uh, when you go to parks, very often the interpreters would love to talk to you. You know, we have, you know, here in the state we have historical parks. We have what we call more recreation parks that are more geared toward things like fishing and swimming and hiking and that kind of stuff but our state parks website offers a list of all the free programs and all the pay for programs too but usually the costs are nominal compared to the experience that you get out of it so i really encourage you to check that out in your area and see what they offer also okay um as i mentioned earlier in the podcast i got really sick this weekend i don't know if it was something that i ate or i just got a stomach bug i'm feeling quite a bit better um today so i'll be back at work tomorrow but i just took today off because i was still feeling pretty puny um this morning when i got up um so i really didn't do much this weekend i just did the bare minimum of what i had to do we had another freeze here this weekend you know people have already got their gardens in and they're all freaking out i don't put my garden in honestly till toward the end of april because our average last frost day to here is april 15th which was yesterday um so you know i'm really glad that i didn't and i did have plants and I had bought some plants at the co-op when I went on Thursday. So I brought all those in the house to kind of protect them. But I haven't put any tender plants out yet because I just know. I have been burned before by putting stuff out too early. And then you have to run out there with bowls and milk jugs and everything under the sun to try to cover stuff up. I mean, it was flat cold here this weekend. Um... And it was very windy, too. So I'm really glad that I didn't have a garden out yet to have to worry about that when I was feeling so bad. Um, I feel, like I said, I feel quite a bit better. So I've just been trying to hydrate again with my fancy cup. <laughs> um, so earlier on Thursday, I had gone by the knitting store um, to visit just to get my ball wandering swift, as I had mentioned. And I sat down for a few minutes and worked on my Curious Handmade shawl. She's also, Stephanie at the Knit Two Together shop is also doing that. And there was another lady in there that was doing it. Well, she had just gotten a shipment from Primrose Yard Company. Oh, Lord. Uh, so, I mean, we were basically just rolling in yarn. There were huge bags of yarn that she had just gotten in from Primrose Yarn Company. So we kind of got to see it first and touch it all and look at all the pretty colors. So I picked out some yarn that she's holding for me um, because I've got in mind something that I want to make, but I'll talk about that later. And I actually asked her if it would be okay if I came in and visited with her and did a little short clip of her um, and ask her a few questions for local yarn shop day because don't forget the 21st which is this Saturday is local yarn shop day and you should go give your local yarn shop some love you know it's hard enough to stay in business as a small business but to serve such a niche market you know um, I really my hats really off to anybody who's willing to take that on uh, and working in retail, even with knitters, you know there's always going to be somebody out there that gets a bee in their bonnet or comes in and takes advantage. You know, I know a lot of shops, you know, they won't even let you come to Knit Night unless you buy, you're there knitting on yarn you've bought from them. And Stephanie will let you bring anything and she'll help you with anything. So I do think you should try to show them some love when they're that generous and open. Um, you know, and, and you go to a Knit Night or you go over there to sit and knit. And I always try to take, you know, I've taken jams and jellies over there before, you know, because you always see people who go over to a knit night and they're always the ones with their hand in the candy jar, but they never bring the candy. 
Um, that aggravates me. <laughs> but anyway, so I don't want to be that person. So I try to, you know, pull my, my fair share of weight when I, you know, go by there and at least buy yarn from her, you know, fairly often. So I've got some yarn on hold over there that I'm going to have. I have a specific project in mind for it. So um, we'll see how that all works out. Um, yeah, so go out to your local yarn shop this Saturday and, and spread the love and take them some candy. <laughs> um, anyway, so a um, couple other things that I wanted to talk about as far as, um, you know, stuff, learning stuff goes. So, okay, I've been using the Norwex stuff now for about a month and a half. And here's sort of my final verdict on what I think about that stuff. Um some of it is very much worth worth it to me and then some of it maybe not so much so here's what i've determined first of all if you have pets this little lint remover mitt is worth every penny okay i think it's about 12 or 14 dollars which seems like a lot but when you consider that those lint rollers are like three dollars a piece and they just generate a huge amount of trash this thing is definitely worth getting, okay? So if you have pets, I would say the lint mitt is definitely worth getting. Um, the mop system, which I have, I have the dry mop, the large-headed dry mop and wet mop, and those are definitely worth the money, especially if you're already using something like a Swiffer. Um, you do have to take them off and wash them, but you have to take the other things off and throw them away. So they don't generate as much waste, which is what I like about them. Plus, the dry mop really gets the stuff off the floor, whereas like with just a regular bristle broom, you know, you miss some of the finer dust. So I would say the mop system is definitely worth the money. The cloths, now I have not used the glass cloth yet. I haven't gone outside and done my, that's what I was going to do is try it on my outside windows and go out and clean all my windows. I haven't done that yet. But the microfiber kitchen cloth, or this is just the microfiber general purpose cloth, I do really like it. Um, and I like it because it has some texture to it. So it's good at cleaning stuff. Plus it is extremely absorbent. This sucker can suck up uh, probably twice or three times its weight in water. I mean, it can really clean up a mess. And it's microfiber. Um, so you can, you know, just throw it in the washing machine, wash it and dry it, you know, whatever it works great. And then this is the kitchen cloth, uh, which is kind of along the same lines, except it's even more textured. Okay. So it seems to work very, very well as well. So like for cleaning your counters or cleaning your stove or whatever. And then again, this has got some antibacterial properties to it. So I would say what I would call the hard goods, the, the, the non-consumable goods are, to me, worth the money. Now, that, these are the only things that I have tried. I've not tried things like the health and beauty aids and all that stuff. Um, now, the other stuff, the odor eliminator and the mattress spray, they worked fine. But when you put a pencil to it, I just don't know that they're, they are worth the money, in my opinion. I use the Nature's Miracle stuff that you can get at the PetSmart. And also, for cleaning my floors and mopping and stuff like that, I use really hot water, vinegar, and some citrus um, vinegar. That I take my citrus peels and I soak them in vinegar. And I mix that in with some cleaning strength vinegar and really hot water. And that, to me, seems to work as well as anything. You know, and a two-gallon jug of vinegar is less than four bucks. Um, so, you know, as far as that stuff goes, because I can put that in a spray bottle and I can spray my countertops with it. Um, you know, I can, can uh, spray it on my mattress or whatever. The Nature's Miracle stuff is like, it's like 25 or $30 for a big, I think it's a two-gallon jug of it, but then you dilute that. Uh, and that's got some enzymatic stuff in it. So if you've got some issues with smell, you know, dog smell or cat smell, um, as my friend Kathy calls the kennel smell, because she has several animals too. And when your house has to stay st shut up, it just smells like dog or cat. Um, so, you know, as far as litter box odors, I find there's nothing better than just plain old baking soda. I clean my litter boxes out with a baking soda vinegar mixture and hot water. 
and then I put a layer of baking soda down before I put my litter in there. And, you know, I think this stuff, the, the, non, the non-consumable stuff, I think is probably worth the money. You know, because they do work well. Um, and if you're already using something like a lot of paper towels or lint roller or a Swiffer where there's a lot of waste generated, I think this is definitely a better way to go. Because, you know, those Swiffer boxes are like, I haven't bought them in a long time, but they're like, what, eight, nine dollars for a box of those pads. And I was going through two or three or four of those to mop my whole house. You know, probably, let's say four of them. So I'd go through a box fairly quickly where now that I've got this pad, I can just use it and throw it in the washing machine. Or I can use it, if I need to clean it, I'll just put it in the sink with some really hot water, rinse it out, and then turn around and use it again on the mop part. Or the dry mop part, I would rinse it out in the sink, throw it in the dryer, then use it again. So to me, it's more environmentally sound than buying a whole bunch of those Swiffer pads or lint roller pads or paper towels or whatever. So I definitely think for the Norwex stuff, the, the consumable, the non-consumable goods are definitely worth the money. For me, the consumables are not worth the money. Um, I make my own laundry detergent. I make my own deodorant. I make my own facial cleanser out of stuff you know I know exactly what goes into all of it um, and I can talk about that sometime at some point uh, if you're interested um, so I don't feel like those are worth the money to me but these definitely are so in term in, in my opinion and they do work they do work as they're advertised to work um, you know hot water and elbow grease is pretty hard to beat when it comes to cleaning and that stuff's relatively cheap so that's sort of my last summation on the norwex stuff so um yeah so we'll come back and talk a little bit about farm life okay so as i mentioned the weather has been nuts and here's kind of the taste of what we had there's a little facebook meme that goes around that's like you know Winter, you know, it says seasons in Arkansas. Winter, summer, tornadoes, snow, you know, kind of as you go through a single, a single day. And we kind of saw a little bit of evidence of that this past week. Um, Friday afternoon, it was very hot and humid. And I'm sitting in my astrophysics class. And I knew that they were calling for the potential of some storms later in the day. I was sitting in my astrophysics class, and a, um, our university has an alert system where it sends up an alert if there's severe weather or if there's something going on on campus or something like that. And it said, due to an enhanced risk of severe weather, campus will be closing at 3 o'clock. And all of my students looked at their phones, and we all looked at each, up at each other, and I said, okay, well, we're done anyway, so let's, let's go on and go. Um... It was very hot and humid that day. You know, where we live in Arkansas, we get a lot of southerly flow off of the Gulf of Mexico. So we get a lot of hot and humid air. And then we get a cold front coming through. And that's, you know, prime time for tornado activity. So I had looked on the National Weather Service um, map. And one thing that I would really, you should really consider doing is find and bookmark the page for your local um, office of the National Weather Service because they will put up risk maps for your location that they update very regularly throughout the day. And, you know, it had an, an elevated risk of severe weather for us. So I said, well, let's just go on and go. And I looked at the weather map and I could tell where the cold front was and where the dry line was. And I kind of knew about how much time we had uh, before the storms would get here. So I got home and got everybody settled and everything. And um, luckily, the worst of the storms actually went around me. Now, I was scheduled that night. If you follow my Instagram, I was scheduled that night to go to our owls class, which I'll talk more about in a little bit. And I wasn't going to go because there were some bad storms that were coming. Well, they came through and blew on by. The first wave kind of blew on by early enough that I felt like I could go ahead and attend the class because I really wanted to go. My friend Sasha was putting it on, and I really wanted to be there. So I went to it, but I did leave it early because the second wave started getting close. And I have some dogs that are really, really scared of storms. Well, we did, in my area, did not get as bad of storms as what just to the west of us or not just to the west but about an hour west of us there was a tornado touchdown 
And then in a town where I work, there was actually some straight line wind damage. They actually called a tornado warning for campus, which came through on my phone, even though I was at home. And um, there was some straight line wind damage on campus. So luckily we didn't have that much here. We had some, a little bit of wind, but it was very, very hard rain and a little bit of thunder and lightning. And I have some dogs that are really, really afraid of lightning and thunder. And I do have thunder shirts for all of them that are really scared. So everybody had their thunder shirt on that was scared. But I have one little dog who is a rescue and he is terrified of even just hard rain. So I know some pair in his past, he has had a terrible um, experience. And even the thunder shirt does not calm him. So I'm probably going to have to look into something like melatonin or something for him um, for storms. Because he just has awful, awful storm anxiety. Uh, but anyway, so we missed out. Luckily here, we missed out on the worst of that, um, thankfully. And so that was on Friday night. Well, then on Saturday, it is freezing cold. I mean, really super cold Saturday morning. Um, I had stopped to get... I had stopped to get donuts uh, for my class because I told them that I would bring donuts. So the local donut shop fixed me up a big carrier of some donuts. So I had stopped to get those. And it was really cold. Um, and the wind was blowing really hard and everything. So we had some crazy weather. And, and I, like I said, I'm really glad that I did not put my garden in yet because, you know, there was a freeze warning through this morning at 6 a.m. So I'm really glad that I hadn't done that yet. Um... But yeah, if you're traveling, because there was a video that went around and, and, you know, people were like, oh, you shouldn't judge them. Well, I am going to judge anybody who is not paying attention to the weather around them when there are apps, there are National Weather Service updates. And if you're going on a camping trip and you're pulling a camper trailer, you should look ahead of time to see what's going on. And then if you're taking a video of a clearly rotating cloud, don't keep driving toward it. It's not that hard to figure out. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to know you probably should not do that. Those people could have been killed. And more to the point, anybody driving around them could have been killed when they just kept driving right into this tornado. Um, it was a little one, thank goodness. So they weren't hurt. But, um, you know, use some common sense, people. It's not that hard. <laughs> Anyway, um, you know, there was these three videos I saw on Facebook. There was that one. There was the people who were driving on a clearly flooded mountain road. And I don't mean it just had a little water on it. I mean, it had like water coursing down it. They just got lucky that that road had not washed away because they could have been killed. And they're sitting, you know, driving, showing this video going, yuck, yuck, look at us. Yeah, well, you could have drove off that thing and died, idiot. And then the last one was from a game park in South Africa where these people are driving a little tiny car right up to a bull elephant. And then everybody's shocked and amazed when the bull elephant turns on them. You know, science literacy is a thing, people, and it can save your life. <laughs> anyway... You know, I'm not going to judge any... Well, I am going to judge somebody that's taking a video of a clearly rotating storm and still driving toward it. Yes, I am going to judge you. Don't do that. Get an app. Educate yourself. Anyway, <laughs> so we had some pretty crazy weather this weekend. Uh, animals are doing good for the most part. I've still just got five baby calves out there. They're all um, growing like weeds. Grass is coming on really good, which is wonderful. Um, you know... I did catch the yard bunny. Somebody was asking about that. I did catch her finally and get her put back in the cage with her daughter. So she's happy. Uh, the, the dogs are doing pretty good for the most part. Although I noticed Feathers, my little older dog that I showed a couple of weeks ago, has not been feeling really great. Um, you know, the sad thing about dogs is they never live as long as we need them to. And I know that her, her time on this earth... And this mortal coil is coming to an end probably sooner rather than later because she's you know, she's an old girl. And um, I guess I'm kind of sad because it's one of the last connections I have to my parents. But, um, you know, we'll keep her happy as long as, as, as we can. And um, then we'll take care of her however we need to at the end. You know, that's the hardest part about being an animal mama, I think, is, is making those tough decisions. Um, 
you know, I've only ever had to do that a couple of times, thankfully, even with all the animals that I've owned. Um, but anyway, so yeah, so we've got um, spring. It's a beautiful, beautiful day outside today. The sun's shining. It's still a little bit chilly, but it's warming up. The sky is a beautiful, beautiful blue. Uh, so we're moving on into some springtime here and lots of things are blooming. My dogwoods are starting to bloom and my apple trees have been blooming and I notice my bees are getting really active. In fact, I think I may have a hive that's thinking about swarming. I was noticing it was really super active when I was walking by a while ago. So I'm going to put my swarm traps up and um, hopefully I can catch a swarm. Uh, my nukes should be in after the 1st of May. So we'll be ready for some more bees to come onto the place then and um, yeah, so that's pretty much farm life for this week. Like I said, not as much to talk about because I was kind of down sick for a couple of days and there's not a lot to say about that. Uh, so we'll come back with a few final thoughts. Okay, just to wrap up with a few last um, thoughts. Today is World Semicolon Day, and if you're not familiar with what that is, it's the idea that the semicolon is not a period at the end of a sentence. It's there's always something that comes after the semicolon. And so your story is not finished yet. Uh, and it's sort of in a way of support of people who have um, certain mental health issues. For example, uh, one of the numbers that I saw, there's 100 million people who live with depression and 15 million people that live with panic and anxiety disorders. Um, you know, and I'm one of those people where I have, um, certainly have depression and I have a little bit of an anxiety issue from time to time. And, you know, people can look like they have it together on the outside and, and when people go, well, why are you depressed? You have all these things. Well, that's not what it's about. It's about, you know, something going on in my case, there's some chemistry imbalances up here and most of the time I do okay but um, you know when when a lot of stuff starts happening sometimes that kind of overwhelms me a little bit more than it does other people and as kind of an introvert myself you know it's very hard for me to ask for support or help um, and so I'm always very grateful when people reach out to me especially my close friends you know, for example, this weekend when I was sick, um, my friend Carol and my friend Tim both reached out and said, do you need anything? Is there anything I can do to, to help up there since you're sick? And, you know, I, that that's very, means a lot to me for people to reach out to me like that because they know that a lot of times I won't ask for help even when I need it. Uh, fortunately, you know, it was where I could get out and do what I needed to do, um, sort of in between waves of, of nausea, uh, get out and do what I needed to do to take care of everybody. Um, and I really appreciate that. But I encourage you to reach out to your friends that are going through a, a struggle, um, you know, and just check in and say, hey, how are you doing? You know, how's it going? Let's go have lunch. Let's go get a Coke, you know, whatever. Um, because a lot of times, you know, when you're in that position, when you're in that hole, as I call it, you know, you don't want to be a burden to people. You don't want to bring other people down so you won't reach out. I mean, I got to the point where I stopped calling my friends because I just felt like that every time I was calling them at one point, all I had to do, all I had was sad news or I was sad, you know, and that's been several years ago. But, you know, you go through those periods of time. So it's always good to have some kind of support system and to utilize that. Um, you know, and I think a lot of times in this community, especially, I see a lot of people who maybe struggle with that a little bit. I think people who are creative by nature, a lot of us have a little bit of that introvertedness or that, um, a little bit of, of, um, depression issues sometimes that people fight because I've seen a lot of people talk about it. Um, you know, and most of us manage just fine. You know, we, we soldier on because we have to you know frankly I think a lot of the reason why I have these little guys is to give me you know focus but um so do check on your friends you know check on your check on your neighbors um I have not heard from my senior pen pal lady I sent a card the last card I sent was last was a week ago last this past Thursday and I made it out to her and her family and I really hope that Either I get a letter from her or that they respond to me in some way because I am really concerned about 
uh, what's going on there, even though I've never met her in person, but, you know, I, I wrote her a letter for the better part of a year, so I would kind of like to know how she is or what's going on. Uh, so I haven't heard from her yet, but I'm hopeful that I'll hear something. Um, you know, we're moving toward the end of the semester at school, and things are going good. You know, we're, I've got a really good class with some really interesting, engaged students in one of my classes, and I'm really excited to talk to some of them a little more deeply about maybe some research projects that we can work on. Uh, Monday of next week, I'm going to the Service Learning Awards Banquet, uh, so I won't be podcasting as regularly on Monday. Um, so I may miss a week. I don't know. We'll see how the rest of the week pans out. We've got our parent night coming up for our kids project at Adkins. Um, I'm a little concerned about what's going on there because there's some changes that they're wanting to make that I'm a little concerned about how it's going to affect our project, but um, I'm not going to let them stop us from doing it, so we'll figure something out. But, um, you know, gifted education is important too. You know, um, we, you know, kids who are, are, you know, thinkers outside the box need to be served by the academic community as well um, to, to aspire to be more, you know. And particularly in rural schools, a lot of times they don't get that, um, you know, we all kind of know where the focus in a lot of schools is. It goes into sports and things like that, which that's fine. But we also need to remember that there are kids out there who can be wonderful artists or writers or mathematicians or scientists. And we need to cultivate those kids too. So that's part of the reason why I volunteer at the school is to provide that um, a little bit of an outlet for that. So I encourage you, even if you don't have a child in that school, if you have some skill set that would be unique and interesting, reach out to a teacher and, and offer to volunteer for them because it's a great way to expose these kids, especially to what I would call old school skills like knitting and crocheting and quilting and sewing and all of these things. And most of the times a teacher would love to have um, those op opportunities for the kids to at least be exposed to that stuff a little bit. So do check that out if you can. Um, so, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at with the end of the week. Um, you know, as I said, it's a beautiful, beautiful sunny day. So that always lift our, lifts our spirits as we move in, we're moving into spring. Um, we got two more weeks of school, and then we'll start our summer schedule. Um, you know, riding, the horses are doing well. Um, I haven't been over there we we had storms on the days that I was scheduled to go over there, so I didn't really get to ride the last week. But you know, there's all summer for that. We'll we'll work on that some. I have somebody hired to come ride at Bo this Saturday, so I'm excited to see what he remembers from the last time he was ridden. Um, yeah, so things are great, and so I hope y'all are all doing good. I hope you're meeting your crafting goals. And until I talk to y'all again, be good to each other, take care of each other, and peace out. Bye.